Hi, this is Yuri Cataldo from The Coin Chat, and I'm joined today with my fantastic guest. Please introduce yourself, Sean. Sure, my name is Sean Weisbrod. I'm the founder of Sidekick. Excellent. All right, so, so we're here in Malta right now, so tell us a little bit more about Sidekick. What is it? What does it do? Why are you here? So we're here promoting the fact that we're about to launch our uh, private beta sometime in December. And what we do is a messaging, payments, and marketplace ecosystem okay. that's seamlessly integrated, and we have our own wallet to manage the payments. Okay. Instead of having our own blockchain yeah. and giving people coins that have no intrinsic value, they don't know who we are, we're instead focusing on mass adoption by supporting the coins that people already know and love. Okay. So how many coins can your platform take right now? Well, since we haven't launched yet, okay. we're, we're very limited. Uh, when we launch, we'll have Bitcoin and Litecoin, okay. and then over time, we'll add more, uh, most likely Dash, and we've been talking with Monero, uh, and, and Neo, and EOS about integration. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll also have the community tell us which ones they want us to support, and we'll try to prioritize that, uh, prioritize that based on you know, what they want. Okay, great. So let's take a little step back though, Sean. So what, uh, so what made you want to start this project? So I lived in China for 10 years. Okay. So I got to see WeChat grow from zero to domination. And what I noticed was, having lived in China, that what happens in Asia is one company tries to dominate every part of a person's life in a local market. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Silicon Valley companies, they try to do one thing really well and dominate globally. But the problem with those local market companies like WeChat is that they can't work outside of the bounds of their market because they're stuck by the fiat currency that they're working with. So if you get rid of the fiat as the main part and you focus on cryptocurrency, then you can immediately become a global force. Sure. So you can have that element of doing something great globally, like the West, while taking elements of Asian aspects of, of company building to manage multiple aspects of people's lives. And then so, I guess let's even go back even further than that. What got you first interested in the cryptocurrency space? So I first heard about Bitcoin in 2011. I had a friend who wanted me to go in on a miner with him. At the time, I didn't really understand it. He wasn't pitching it very well, so I just poo pooed it. Okay. In 2014, I was running local uh, nonprofit events in China, and one of my speakers was an Israeli guy, and he was promoting Bitcoin. This is 2014. Okay. I still didn't understand it, because he was going really technical, and so I, I just kind of glossed over it. 2015, another Israeli friend of mine was saying, hey man, Bitcoin, this thing is coming up, you need to learn about it. And uh, he got me an opportunity to speak about it a few months later in, in Macau. Mm -hmm. So from the time he started talking about it and sold the speech, I spent every minute I could, you know, five, six hours a day, learning about what is Bitcoin, what is a blockchain, what's Merkle root, I, I got deep into the tech. Okay. And, you know, I started learning about it from there. And then, at the time, I was also about 2015, 2016, working with startups in China to raise funding, uh, for equity funding. And then one of my friends introduced me to a blockchain startup that was looking to, to raise equity funding. So I was able to close a round for them with a Chinese investor, so an, an American team in China. And I raised for seed uh, equity. And I used the commission to start day trading in crypto. And that got me into ICOs coming in, and so then Western ICOs heard about me and wanted me to raise in China for them when it was still legal. And uh, then they started asking me to advise them, and then they needed exchange listings. And so I kind of went through the whole cycle uh, of the industry, including even research and development on blockchains for different clients. And then when the market started to look down in March of 2018, I decided now is the time to start investing what I've made into building my own company that can really be a, a force once the market comes back. And so in March 2018, I started working on Sidekick and now the market's going back into full force and we're getting ready to launch, just as I you know, assumed it would. Okay, excellent. So your, so your platform, are you... So I'm, I'm curious to talk more about your Let's say connection, not connection, but uh, the work with so WeChat. So WeChat is dominated in the in the Chinese industry, but it's also run partially by the government or invested heavily by the government. So what the Chinese government does is, yeah. in order to be able to control local companies, yeah. they invest in them. Okay. So the the big difference between America and China is America says, okay, you want, you know Silicon Valley, go, you can yeah. invest. But they're hands-off in investing in local startups, right. so they can't help them grow. Right. 
Instead, what China does is they say, we want this thing to, to go. So for example, they have a, a Congress meeting every five years where they plan out what they're going to focus on in the next five years. In the last meeting, they said, we're going to focus on blockchain and AI. Okay. And so now they have unlimited funds to do whatever they need to make that happen. So you see a lot of AI startups in China coming up now, focusing on facial recognition, self-driving cars, and things like that, because the government is taking funds and investing directly into these startups and giving them applications to work with. They're giving them clients. They're saying, hey, I want you to do facial recognition for my subway or for my police station, and we're going to pay you to do it. So they're enabling adoption in different technologies way faster than America could even imagine because they're facilitating it with their own funds. And that's something that is really dangerous in, to America because they're afraid of China's growth. Okay. And so instead of learning from China, they're trying to stifle China. And that's not going to work. Yeah. I'm sorry, I could talk about China all day. <laughs> no, no, that's good. It's, it's very fascinating yeah. having lived there, watching it evolve and change. It was uh, definitely the best use of you know my 20s. Yeah, that's great. Sure. So it's, it's partly because so you're you've been in America, you've been in China. How are you taking I guess the best of both worlds and integrating that into your platform so that you can I guess use the best of what's happening in both places to make your platform succeed? Right. So uh, I did get a lot of inspiration from WeChat where. They do have a marketplace, but it's a separate app. Okay. They do have messaging and payments, but their payments are in digital fiat. They can't touch crypto because the government doesn't support crypto. They support blockchain as a technology. Okay. So Tencent can use Tencent owns WeChat. Tencent can enable the digital fiat transactions using a blockchain to manage the ledger, but they can't use a crypto. They can only use digital RMB. Okay. So they can enable this, however. The crypto is what's stopping them from growing outside of their own market. So what I loved about WeChat was they had a lot of different uh, functionality and different things that are integrated, but nobody else did. Mm -hmm. However, because of the nature of their background with the Chinese government, they're stuck in China. So we can take those elements and put yeah. them in different countries by focusing on the crypto part. Okay. So in your so with with your company, are you rolling out I guess in country specific, or will there be one platform that's global that people then from different countries can plug into? So the way that I look at it is it can and should be global. Right? We're mobile first, mm -hmm. focus on cryptocurrency use. Okay. Uh, and welcome to deal with regulation in order to make it possible to grow. There the the, the interesting thing is the most engagement we've seen on social media is from the US. Okay. Which also happens to have the hardest regulations to right. deal with. So we have to navigate as a Singaporean company how to make the SEC and these other agencies in the US happy enough to allow us to exist. Right. So we can only do our best to attract the local communities. Uh, from different cryptocurrencies and different blockchain companies and hope that we can spread that way. Um, focusing on specific countries I think is is something that is uh, much harder to do because you have to have resources and local partners oh, sure. and so it's a lot easier to just have a kind of wide net and then see what happens and then focus from there. So when you first, when you do launch this, your, your I guess your, your product, is it going to be, I guess, will the, the US market be excluded right now until you work through the regulation part? Or is I it... have no problem. Okay. I don't want to exclude anybody. Okay. If a government believes that our product is not good for them, we can't prevent them from banning us. But I don't think that they're going to have that mindset because we're willing to talk to them about regulation. Sure. So the way that a lot of technology works is you build it, then they tell you to regulate, and then you work with them to make it possible. Okay. So, for example, Singapore, where we're incorporated, they have a new law that they've passed in June that goes into effect in January. And the way that they've set it up is, if you build something and launch it before this thing changes, we'll give you a six to 12 month exemption depending on what the technology and the service is. So build it, and then figure out how to make it legal. And that's how most tech works. Wonderful. All right, so I know again that you, you said you're, you're finishing up the, the product right now. You have an idea of time frame, maybe three months, six months from now. Will people be able to use it and test it and try it out? We're shooting for a December private beta. Okay, oh great. Yeah, right now we're in the process of squashing all the bugs. Okay. We spent the last six months building a ton of features to, to give people the experience that they're used to. We're not quite there yet, but 
we're in the process of fixing the bugs from the features we've already developed okay. so that when we launch, even though there's not as many features as I would like, yeah. it's still a clean enough and smooth enough experience that they'll be willing to stay on and keep using it and wait for us to develop out more. Okay, excellent. Well, you said private beta, so is it, uh, how does people get signed up for the private beta? Is it possible or is it like invite only the people that you currently know? So right now we're, we're open to allowing anyone to register for the beta okay. and it'll be first come first serve. So let's say on the day of the private launch we'll allow 50 to 100 people to download it. Gotcha. And then the next week maybe another 10 or 15. So we'll slowly onboard people from the list in order to make sure that the, the system can manage it, can handle it, it that, you know, there's nothing that's too major that would require us to stop and shut down. So um, right now we're doing a Trezor giveaway and so we're hoping that will help us to drive a lot of attraction to the product uh, because everybody loves crypto hardware wallets. Yeah, they do. So, oh, great. So Trezor's a brand name. If our watchers and listeners would like to sign up for the beta or sign up for the Trezor giveaway, how can they do that? Well, if they go through our website, they can sign up for the beta. If they want to go through the Trezor giveaway, yeah. they'll still get to the beta, okay. but they'll also get entered for the Trezor giveaway. Right. So uh, we'll have a pop-up on the website that they'll see, or we've got posts on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all these websites that if they find us, uh, they can go through Trezor that way as well. Great. And what is your website? Sidekickapp.io. Sidekickapp. Sidekickapp.io. Okay. Yes. S I D E K I C K A P P. dot I O. Sidekickapp.io. Perfect. And then is that what your your Sidekick app on LinkedIn, Telegram? Yes. Uh, so yes, si uh, Telegram is Sidekick app. Okay. Facebook is Sidekick app io. Great. Twitter. Twitter is Sidekick app io. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, some people from a long time ago, they got the name Sidekick app and they're they're not existing companies, but it's really hard to get these platforms to transfer ownership. So some of them we have Sidekick app, the others are uh, Sidekick app. That's right. Well, thank you so much. Sean from Sidekick, thank you so much for coming and joining us in Malta. For all of our watchers and listeners, we'll put the links down in the show notes so you can click right through and join the beta and also sign up for his giveaway.